Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make better decisions and more money copy trading. I'm Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. Links to everything, including Discord and Facebook groups, are in the link tree in the show notes. Today is the first conversation of Season 2, and you might think it would be difficult to get a tech investor in the hot seat at a time like this. But have no fear, we've got a big strapping Afrikaner standing up at a time when others might shrink away. Here we go. Season 2, Episode 2 of Copy Traders Club, and it is none other than long-standing PI Reinhard Kutzia. You might know him as Reinhard Kotze. Quick note, this recording experienced numerous difficulties, both real-world, a gardener streaming, plus the noises of birds and children, plus technical issues, internet connection and issues with new microphone settings. So there is no bonus video, sadly, and my audio in the middle section is a little tinnier than the soothing auditory cream to which you have become accustomed. Still okay though, and no worse audio quality than most of the podcasts out there. Reinhardt is out of the limo and taking manly strides up the stone staircase of the Copy Traders Clubhouse. Reinhardt, hello. Welcome by Copy Traders Club. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Donkey, uh, Gavin. That was a good effort. Thanks. Well, it's a good effort that you've made to be here today at the Copy Traders Clubhouse, and we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much for the invite. It's a real pleasure to be speaking with you and your listeners. As a listener yourself, you'll know that in order to get into the Copy Traders Lounge, you've got to answer a series of quick fire questions, okay? Sure. Username on eToro. Reinhard Kutzia. Date you joined eToro. July of 2016. Date you became a popular investor. Uh, somewhere towards the middle of 2017. Year of birth. 1982. Place of residence. Johannesburg. Profession. Technology consultant. Briefly state what you aim to achieve on eToro. Well, that's changed over time. It uh, definitely started as a place for me just to invest in US stocks, but uh, over time, becoming a popular investor, uh, it's, it's definitely a, f a place for me to build my own wealth, but also, you know, do my bit as much as possible to uh, educate, you know, follow copiers and investors and take them along with me. Name one of your investing heroes. I know it's a bit cliche and boring, but it's part of the reason I started, is uh, Warren Buffett. Name one of your favorite investing books. Uh, it's one that I read pretty recently. It's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. That completes the formalities. Let's proceed into our VIP section here at the clubhouse. The magnificent copy traders lounge awaits you, the inner sanctum. Reinhard Kutzea. Are you ready for this magical transition? I'm ready, Gavin. Thanks. Okay, so Reinhard Kutzia, badly mispronounced as Reinhard Kutzi by most of us. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty close. It's pretty good. It's good enough. <laughs> okay, how do you say it again exactly? Uh, it's uh, well, Afrikaans so or in South Africa, it'd be Reinhard Kutzia. But uh, you know, in English, most people would say you know, either Reinhard Kutzi or a couple of variations on that. Now, are you any relation to the esteemed and award-winning South African author J. M. Kutzia? Uh, not as far as I know. I haven't done the DNA analysis, but uh, no, not as far as I know. <laughs> oh, I, I had a funny feeling you were going to say yes. It's, <laughs> I mean, I'd say that's a reasonably common South African name, but there can't be that many. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I suppose uh, 
used to be more common. I don't know if there's just fewer Afrikaans people around these days, but yeah, it, it is a fairly common one. Well, that's kind of one thing I wanted to ask you about because there does seem to be quite a few PIs on eToro from South Africa, most of whom don't live there anymore. Yeah, yeah. So obviously there's a Ruby M today. I think she's done incredibly well. Uh, I think she's one of the most copied on eToro at the moment. I think Wesley is another very popular one. I think he used to come from South Africa. He's obviously, I, both, I think both of them are living in the UK. I think that's generally the story with a lot of South Africans. Uh, you know, uh, moving across, all, we've really scattered all over the world. Uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. Unfortunately, yeah, well, fortunately, it's just uh, there are some there are some issues in South Africa. <laughs> well, there are a few more South Africans to come in season two. That's awesome. Both living abroad and staying in South Africa. So, look forward to talking to them. What is it about South Africans that that makes eToro attractive to them? Why, why are there so many, considering the small population? I think uh, I've had actually discussions with this about with eToro about this. If you, uh, for me, that's the reason I found eToro was because the options were so limited in investing in US stocks and things like that, investing in instruments like that. There are options like that, but traditionally it would be through the big banks, the investment banks. The fees would be astronomical. It would just be very complicated to set up. It's more reserved, useful, traditionally more reserved for you know very high income uh, class of people. And for the average investor, the, you know, the options just wasn't uh, just wasn't easy. So Toro just made it a lot easier to get access to the markets. And I think uh, everybody would agree in Toro. It just in general, makes it very easy for people to invest in. in different things like stocks, like crypto, like ETFs, all those kind of things. So I think that's one of the big drawing cards for South Africans. I think another thing for South Africans is South Africans are looking for alternative ways of you know, additional income, making money and investing their money. Uh, it's just the reality of it. And I, it's actually interesting. I don't know if it's still the case, but a couple of years ago, one of the, I think from, uh, if you search which country was searching Bitcoin the most, South Africa was number one. So and and where to, how to invest in Bitcoin? So that was like the most search from from a country was from South Africa. So I think it just speaks to you know people in South Africa looking for ways and means of you know where to put their money. Yeah, that kind of explains maybe the user base in South Africa, but the fact that there are quite a number of PIs from South Africa also suggests to me something about the sort of self starter resilient nature of South Africans, or maybe not resilient, but self-reliant, maybe is the term I mean. I think it's actually quite interesting for a country like South Africa. Um, we've had a lot of very high profile, very successful people out there. I mean, Elon Musk is probably <laughs> a, a crazy example, but there's a couple of other ones. Uh, uh, and just from an entrepreneurial perspective, there's uh, you know some high-profile people that has made uh, I can't remember his name now, but he's also starting a, very, uh, a large tech company that's just listed on the Nasdaq exchange, also from South Africa. So I think that entrepreneurial spirit is definitely a big, big thing in South Africa. Yeah. Are you much like what I would consider to be the typical Afrikaner, as in? You know, you would know how to live out in the middle of nowhere and be self-reliant. When was the last time you were fixing a generator? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. A generator is quite an apt thing you should mention because we also have the rolling blackouts in South Africa uh, because of our energy crisis here. So generators are a common things. So you kind of almost have to know how to fix a generator <laughs> if you're living in South Africa. But no, to answer your question, I think, no, I'm definitely not that kind of Afrikaner. <laughs> Growing up, my dad was, we'd go hunting and he would be that kind of, you know, the Afrikaans saying is a boer market plan. So a farmer makes a plan so you can fix anything, doesn't matter where you find yourself, but I'm not that guy. So I've completely thrown myself into the technology sphere and what I studied and what I enjoyed. So no, that's not me. But I, I, I get by, I do what I have to do. To you know, do a bit of DIY around the house and that kind of thing, but nothing serious. <laughs> okay, soft hands. It's the way of the world these days. Exactly, exactly. 
Okay, let's talk about how I came across you. You've been around for a long time, as we'll come on to later when we look at your stats. You're a pretty high profile PI without being sort of top tier. You're not one of the first names that trips off people's tongues, but you're very long established. And I'm sure like many PIs, the first time I heard your name was on Felix Falix's YouTube channel and he did a review of you. I'm sure you've seen that, have you? Yeah, no, I saw, saw that. And uh, I think Felix Felix actually, the first time I saw it was a comment made about copy sync. I, I know you've also talked about that. So and I replied to him about that. And we had a, a bit of a conversation on Etor about that. So, uh, but yeah, I think uh, in terms of the profile in Etoro, like I said, I've been around quite some time, I suppose, um, comparatively speaking, since 2016. I focus on what I focus. It, it is technology. So sometimes it's in favor, sometimes it's not so much in favor. At, you know, at the moment, it's not so much in favor. And I think Itoro, to a certain degree, also manipulates that in a way. I wouldn't say manipulating, but, you know, you know they're also showing people what may be the best place to, you know, which popular investors may be more safer to follow, given where we are in the market. I've profiled a couple of times on Editor's Choice, and that obviously gives you a huge boost. And I think I did make it very briefly to Elite Pro and had my Black Star. But, you know, the way tech stocks move, it's, it's a bit more of a volatile area of the market. So, you know, it goes up and down. And unfortunately, that's just the name of the game. The copiers on eToro, the way, you know, the nature of people is also to, you know, to get on and get off again. So, yeah, I think at one stage I was like maybe up, in the top 10 most copied and now I've dropped I like think maybe somewhere in the top 30 still I think I don't know maybe yeah interesting you should bring that up I did plan to make a point of repeating what I said in the first episode of season two which is that it's very easy for PIs to appear when everything's rosy and things are going great and they love the spotlight and oh come and talk to me talk to me look at my returns the last few months it's quite a different story when you've gone through the last three months of turmoil and you're certainly an example of that. So what I said last week and certainly applies to you is extra kudos for, to those PIs who are prepared to come on this podcast during difficult times because it'd be much easier to shy away and say, give me a shout in September when things are different. So fair play. Yeah, look, I think. Um... There is also this part to the market. I think uh, I've I've said it before on my feed and stuff. Um, there's like an admission price to investing. You can't just have the gains without paying the price, and the price you pay is the volatility. And especially when you're investing in things like technology or growth, high growth companies, you the reward is higher, but so is the volatility. So, you know, over the time that I spent on Etoro. You know, you can definitely see that when times are good, you know, people praise you as, uh, you know, you're a genius. <laughs> and then you have three months not looking so good. And then, you know, people, you know, it's quite the opposite reaction. But I think in general, I've been quite fortunate. I think I've, I've seen some really bad kind of interactions with some of the PIs, uh, some people getting really upset. And I, I get that. But I think for the most part, I've been pretty lucky with that. I think People copying me, especially people copying me for a long time, um, they kind of get the way the market moves and they kind of understand what they're investing in. And I think that's important. So, but uh, yeah, if you had to look at it now, my portfolio, you know, the stats of the last couple of three, three, couple, three months or so, it doesn't look good. But, you know, that is just, it is almost, I want to say normal. It is just the way the market moves and the way different sectors move. Yeah, I mean, it is normal. I remember growing up and hearing the warning share prices can go down as well as up. And I thought it was a ridiculous thing to have to say to people. But, <laughs> you know, I find myself saying much the same thing now in conversations on eToro to copiers who are jumping up and down. They can't believe that suddenly they're losing money. I think the eToro user base has grown exponentially in the last couple of years. And a lot of that growth came in during that 2020 explosion of growth, if you want to call it that, from technology companies. 
And a lot of people also said you had a combination of factors, people sitting at home and looking for ulterior motives, you know, where to invest and things like eToro come across the radar. So you had a lot of people investing for the first time, possibly during that time. And like you say, I think we've been spoiled the last, not just in 2020 after the, you know, when the market started recovering after the pandemic, the first shock of it started fading. We've been spoiled for the last couple of years. I think in the last, out of the last, I looked at the stats the other day, I might be butchering it a bit, but in the last 18 years, 16 of those years have been up years. Uh, and then if I talk about the S&P 500, and it's, you know, if you look back at a 100-year history, that's not normal. It's more like every two out of three years that you, you can expect an up year versus a down year. So, yeah, to your point, I think a lot of people, like, you know, stocks also can go down. It's like what? And, uh, you know, the fact that you can have a down year in the market is also, you know, it's it's very realistic. It's something you should expect as an investor. Okay, let's get to know you a little bit better, Reinhardt, by asking you, other than fixing generators, tell us something you're very bad at. I'm very bad at, and it's going to sound like a very soft hands kind of thing again, but I'm very bad at um, focusing on what I'm doing. I've got like, at any given day, I've got like three monitors open and I'm not like one of those stock traders with the three monitors open. I'm like researching just from my pure, like from my interest point of view, technology and investing as well, obviously. But my tab control just gets out of control. So I'll be focusing on one thing and I'll be tab. I'll find myself five minutes later and all I've done is just been literally tabbing through 20 tabs on Chrome and not accomplishing anything. So I'm trying to get better at that. Okay, let's have a question from the art of people. Can you pick a number between 1 and 10? Let's go for 10. Interesting. I don't think anyone's chosen this before. How would your favorite teacher describe you? If it was my favorite teacher and the teacher also kind of liked me, I think the teacher would describe me as uh, has a lot of potential, but does not always display it, (laughs) something like that. (laughs) That's a classic teacher remark. (laughs) Oh, so it wasn't just me. (laughs) Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Copy Traders Club. Copy Traders Club. Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? Copy Traders Club. Copy Traders Club. Okay, Reinhardt, let's move to your profile on eToro. And if I could ask you to read the three central paragraphs of your bio, education, background, and strategy. Can you read those for us? Sure. So uh, education, uh, CC, uh, CISI, International Advanced Wealth Management, various qualifications in business intelligence, data analytics, industrial automation, and software engineering. Then as background, I work with large tech consulting firms on smart manufacturing and IoT projects. Over the years, I have gained some unique insights into some of the most promising technology trends, products, and services. And then strategy, my investing strategy is focused on technology themes, shaping our future, what that might look like in the next five to 10 years, researching and selecting companies that stand to benefit the most, mainly growth companies with the potential to achieve more competing returns. Okay, so we're faced with a couple of challenges here, Reinhardt. We've got a gardener and a child, your child, crying a little bit, but I'm sure the listener won't mind if that interferes with the audio slightly. So you're a long-term buy-and-hold tech investor. But in recent times, you seem to be diversifying a little bit away from pure tech. Is that fair to say? Uh, I think the majority or the vast majority is definitely still still, still tech. Uh, I think just given where we are in the market, you know, I'm never going to change it completely. But I think we also, you know, as a popular investor or just investor in general, you've got to respond a little bit to what, where the market is. And I think if you look at that long-term macro view of where we are in the market cycle, um, with the Fed tightening interest rates again, um, yeah, so what I'm doing is just using, in terms of diversification, just using ETFs. 
just to get some more market exposure in different sectors. So I've got a couple in there just to get some exposure into the financial sector using the XLF ETF. And just also in terms of um, energy, um, using XLE. And then a very small portion of it is also in crypto that I added again recently. Um, but yeah, uh, I've always said it. I'm not I'm definitely not a crypto expert. I definitely like the technology. So, um, you know, I approach that as the same as I do for stocks. So it's going to be long term holding in assets or, you know, things that I think has a very large upside potential given the downside risk. You say the largest part of your stock investing wealth is in this portfolio and that you have a very long time horizon. You mentioned 20 years plus. So clearly you're prepared to tolerate the risk that growth stocks offer, or should I say the volatility, to get those long-term returns. Absolutely. So that's the way I look at it. For me, I think every for every person it's obviously different, and I think that's a big portion of of that is how much you've, time you've got to withstand the kind of volatility you're going to see with growth stocks. For me, I still I think at least another twenty years. I want to be a you know investor for life, so I think that gives me another at least twenty years until retirement, and probably past that. But when you mention the largest part of my wealth in the stock portfolio, so yeah, it sort of definitely represents the largest part of my net worth, if you want to call it that, as an investment portfolio in stocks. I do have a couple of just like an ETF so that I use it on, on, you know, locally in South Africa, just in tax-free savings, tax beneficial accounts that I just put money into a, an ETF there. But that's what I always say, you know, for, for somebody copying, you've got to weigh up your own risks and what you see and that time horizon that you've got. And maybe depending on your risk tolerance, depending on how much time you've got left, uh, my portfolio might be a good fit as part of a larger portfolio. You know, uh, if you want some tech exposure, then I think my portfolio is obviously a very good fit. I obviously believe in tech as my portfolio, that you, what you see there is the representation there is what I believe is what's going to give me the biggest return for my investment dollars over a long period of time. But it's not for everybody. and It's not for everybody to have just that kind of exposure to technology stocks. Um, and I understand that. Yeah, while some PIs might reduce their minimum recommended copy period in order to draw in more copiers, you don't mess about. I've seen you saying greater than five years. Yeah, Gavin, I, I, I was like, even with my friends and people in my circle, like asking me about, obviously, when, you know, with eToro and everything, also want to get into it. So for me, the easiest thing is always to say, if you can, every dollar that you put in the market is a dollar that you should not have to or want to get out of it within at least five years. And if you can do that, I think you'll be successful. You almost, in a stat show, you almost, you almost guaranteed success. It's the closest thing you're going to get to a guaranteed success in the stock market. If, if it's, it's a time in the market. I know that's a cliche, but think with it really is the truth. The longer you can stay in, the better you are, the better your odds of success. So for me, the five years is almost like, you know, that's your, that's the time horizon you should be looking at. And and beyond it, the longer you can get in, the longer it compounds. And that's really where the true growth comes from. Okay. Speaking of five years, let's look back five years over your period, five years and beyond. You started in 2016 and for half a year, 14% return. 2017, 43%, roughly speaking. 2018, you're minus 0.38%, a year when a flat year was a relatively good result on eToro. That was the year that Jay Nemesis lost 50%. 2019, 35%, 2020, 84%, and then 2021, 3.18%. So another relatively flat year. And it's looking like that was your second lowest annual performance since joining eToro. And was in fact your first bad year because it was well below market returns. But your portfolio or your performance overall is obviously very impressive. You must be happy with it. Yeah, I'm very happy with it. Obviously, I mean, we talked about it a little bit earlier. If you've just joined recently, 
And there might be a lot of people frustrated, sorry, with the results they're seeing. But I always, you know, it's difficult if you just thought it recently. But if I look back over the last two years, I'm still, I think, outperforming the S&P, the five, S&P 500 by about double. Uh, if you look back over five years, I think it's, I, I can't remember, I looked at the fact sheet on it just the other day, I think it's like 260% total return versus 90 something percent for the S&P. You know, even if I just got the S&P results for the last five years, I think that's a pretty good result for most investors uh, over the last five years. So being able to double that and more over the last five years, I'm very happy with that result. For me, you know, I've, I've been in it long enough, so I kind of understand that you can't just look at that last three months or even that last year. You've got to look at it over longer terms. So if I can look at it over the five-year rolling period and I'm, I'm beating the market uh, and I've got that annualized return, which is also beating the market, I'm, I'm very happy. Yeah, and how do you deal with copiers then that have joined in more recent times? And as far as they're concerned, their whole record with you is not good. And I mean, I see this a lot on eToro and you see people saying, you know, Am I supposed to believe your returns were so good and then suddenly I join and everything goes <laughs> downhill? Yeah. Like, like I said, I think I've been fairly lucky to not have extremely negative comments. I've had a few, definitely. But I've also had, I think majority of it's been positive comments and I'm surprised and I'm very, really, very happy to see that even given the last couple of months, the copiers have dropped for sure. But Going into this a couple of years ago, my I was fully prepared to, like, if you're going to hit a, a period like this, I was expecting to lose maybe like, like 80 90% of copies, just given the nature of eToro and trading platforms in general. So I'm very happy to see um, that that's not the case. I would like to think that's part of the reason is, like I mentioned earlier, just that portion of a PI's job, which I think is part of it is being the educator. So posting on your feed, I think that that helps just keeping the communication open, you know, letting people know that you're suffering with them. It's never nice. I understand this is normal. This is just the way the market moves. But a lot of people joining now doesn't understand that. And just maybe having that communication open and letting them understand you're also feeling it. It's not fun for anybody going through a period like this. But if you can show them the facts and you can show them the figures and you show them the data, you know, going back 10, 15 years, and you can understand that this is just how the market moves. You know, that I listened to this the other day as part of that Morgan Housel who was talking about this. And it was like, you know, on average, the S&P 500 returns over the last 100 years, let's call it 10% a year. But in reality, it never returns 10% a year. It's more like either it returns 30% a year or it returns minus 20% a year. That's far more likely. So for just for investors to understand that, that it is, it is normal. There's nothing broken about it. It doesn't mean the copy trading system doesn't work. It doesn't mean the markets doesn't work. It doesn't mean things are being manipulated. It just It's the natural way of the market works. You're going to have years where the S&P is down 20%. It's normal. It's happened many times before. And that's where, to go back what I mentioned, that's the kind of the price you pay, it's that admission fee to have those long-term profits. So the mindset for me is probably one of the biggest things in, in being a successful investor. And I, I research that a lot uh, and I try and put a lot of, as much as that on the feed as I can. Let's talk about copier numbers and assets under management. Copier numbers 2551 at the time of recording. Assets under management, I can't see on your profile. I don't know if you want to divulge that, or it's probably on your fact sheet, is it? It's it's on the fact sheet, yeah. I think it's just over five still at the moment, 5.3, 5.2, around there. And the story of your copier graph is a picture of a pretty slow decline, which is quite common among PIs. Your copier numbers have been decreasing since your peak of, what, about 5,000 once upon a time? Yeah, I think it was around 5,000, and I think it peaked around just towards the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. So, you know, it just it goes to show again that it's just the way it works. It, uh, that was after that, my best year on eToro, and I think it, probably the best year for many tech-oriented portfolios was 84% in that year or something like that. 
So obviously gained a lot of copiers during that year, towards the end of that year. And then, you know, it started tapering off again from there, which is, like you said, it's it's pretty, I think, pretty common on eToro. Yeah, it's on the decline, but not a steep decline. You seem to have a large proportion of loyal copiers who are not abandoning you because of 2021. Yeah, it's always difficult to gauge just by the feedback you get. But like I said, I think I'm I'm pretty lucky that way. I think there's a, a pretty a good following of people that's been copying me for quite some time. If I look at some of the comments I've been getting, you know, these are people that have been copying for two, three years, which I think is not very common on eToro to have people copying for such a long time. What's nice about that is just like you said earlier, you, you know, you get that negative comment and somebody's saying, you know, you know, what are you doing? This is wrong, this is broken, I'm down twenty percent by copying you. But then you'll have a comment straight after that saying, you know, from somebody that's copying me for a long time saying, but, you know, they, they're still over 100% in profit. So it's it's not broken. It's just, you know, timing timing matters. <laughs> yeah, it definitely does, especially in the short term. Especially in the short term. But as you say, that's kind of how, it, how the game is being played. Unfortunately, everyone's chasing the same football of good performance today. Exactly. So you see some of these PIs currently, if they've had a good January, suddenly they're moon shooting. Their copier numbers are going crazy just because they had a good January compared to everybody else. Yeah, and I think especially during times like these, if you've got somebody that's, uh, you know, maybe f- focusing on something like more like Forex, I've listened to your previous uh, podcast with Olivier. Obviously, he's like, you know, his record is amazing. It's just all green. So I think during times like this, where the market is a little bit volatile, PIs like that, that's more uncorrelated to the market, they'll use, I think that's that's times where they, they'll get a huge boost in, in copiers as well. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely the dangerous, more dangerous side to it as well. You do have the, the, the other guys as well that just had one, one or two good months, and then there's a lot of copiers just jumping on board and that. And uh yeah, we can, yeah, I'd like to talk about that in detail as well. But it's one of the biggest things, I think, is just you know, the data shows you know, people jumping between investments. It's where like, a majority of wealth gets lost in the stock market. It's just jumping between different kind of investments. Definitely the way to lose money copy trading is to hop about like mad thing, yeah. trying to find the latest hot wave to ride. You know, yeah. like There are some PIs you see at the moment who have very short records. And just because they're doing quite well at the moment, whatever formula they're using, maybe shorting the market. But, you know, they haven't got a track record of success, yet everyone's flocking to them as the savior during these difficult times. What happens when things turn again? Yeah, I remember clearly when I just started, I think, back in 2016, obviously looking at, you know, the guys who were like, at that stage, being promoted a lot by Toro and being on the top of the PIs list and things like that. And I don't want to mention the name, but I remember this one specifically. I think he was right at the top, being promoted all over the place, but he was predominantly focused on shorting the market. I think just before 2016, there was a period of like a year or two where the market wasn't doing so well. It was pretty flat or down. So he was looking good. Straight after that, obviously, you know, you had, you had the bull run just accelerating again from there and he just lost everything. Uh, I think he went from the most copied person at that stage. I mean, that stage, I think it wasn't nearly the numbers we see now with people like Jay Nemesis and stuff. I think they had like 3,000 or something copies. But at that stage, that was a huge number. And I think he lost all of it. I think the count is closed uh, shortly after that. And I kind of followed it just out of interest, not a, not in a statistical way, but just for my own reference to see, again, how you know, market behaviors and people's psychologies and stuff work. And throughout, I think the next year, it was always like a justifying that, you know, the next market crash is coming. And, you know, you're, he's also just down now by like 20% this month because the market's a really good run, but this is unsustainable. The market's in a bubble and it will crash by 50% in the next year or two. All the technical analysis is showing that that will happen. And of course, it never did. And, you know, shorting the market was a very bad idea during that time. So I think, you know, you've got to be careful in you know how you approach who you're copying and what they what they're investing in not just pick a name that seems popular but have a look at what what they're doing and do you do you agree personally if you do then 100 percent. but at least you know 
if they lose money and so and and by extension you lose money, you understand why. Sure. Well, that's what we're all about here at Copy Traders Club. We're trying to establish what are good practices for copy trading and what are the pitfalls to avoid. So I'm sure the listener knows better, but we need to reach out, try and get more ears so that people don't just FOMO into people the way they would into the latest meme. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think depends on how you start. Also, I listened to this the other day. It's like, you know, who's going to be more successful as an investor, the people that start with a 20% gain in the first year or a 20% loss? Uh, and I think it's a bit of a coin toss exactly where it stands. So you, you, if you've got people that, you know, 2020 20, bought a couple of tech stocks, you doubled your money, it feels pretty good. You extrapolate that. You think you're on fire. You think you're a genius. <laughs> but then the disappointment comes. Or the other group that starts off in a year and is, you know, you, you lose like 20% of your money. Um, which group is going to be successful over the long term? I think I almost lean towards the group that, that makes money because even though it's, it can be dangerous, I think people that lose 20% or gain 20% that first year, but then lose money a little bit later, they will remember how good it felt and they, they'll still be in the game. Hopefully they'll stay investing. But I think the group that loses a lot of money in the beginning, they'll be scared out of the market completely and they'll probably never get in again. Well, that's the sad thing for me about, especially like in a year like 2020 or 2021, when all the meme stocks started, I think there's a lot of people lost a lot of money, you know, during that time and maybe never, they'll never be investors again. And that's, you know, that's, yeah, like you said, you try and avoid, try and avoid that. All right. Let's talk a little bit about communication. Would it be true to say that you have increased your communications over time since you've been a PI? I now see frequent posts and quarterly video updates. Tell us about that development and where it may go in the future. Yeah, definitely. I think when I first became a PI, it came up almost naturally. I noticed that a few copiers. It wasn't something I was specifically looking to do. Uh, I think Itora actually contacted me and said, you've got a few copies. Do you want to sign up for the program? And I thought, yeah, there's nothing to lose. Let's, let's do it. But at that stage, yeah, I mean, there was, not, there was hardly any communication or posts. It's, I've always been, you know, I'm not a, you, I don't think you'll find me on Twitter. I'm there, but I, you, you won't find any posts from me from Twitter. I'm hardly on Facebook. I try my best with YouTube, but in terms of social media, I'm not that kind of person really. But that's definitely changed. And I think it's just the nature of where we are today i have to force myself out of that comfort zone and just post a little bit more but i found that you know i've enjoyed that actually putting a lot of the stuff we're talking about now those concepts those mindset the psychology of things putting it down on paper looking at the facts and the stats i love looking at the data uh, and just putting that on the feed the quarterly update videos um, that came about more from itoro's perspective i think once i reached a certain level in AUM or however they measured it, I think they asked uh, popular investors to start doing these quarterly updates uh, videos. Um, so that's been very good. It forced me to also, you know, do some video updates and put that on YouTube and put it on the feed. In terms of the future, I mean, you know, I'd love to. I'd love to get more into the whole YouTube thing. But like I said, I'm a pretty shy person when it comes to that. I don't mind talking and doing some presentations and stuff, but I mean, who wants to be making YouTube videos? I don't either. <laughs> no, really. But it's a lot of time, Gavin. It's really a lot of time. Like I've done it a few, and like I don't know if I'm just like it's a little bit of the ADD in me. But like then I'll spend like hours editing the thing and trying to make it perfect. And I think nobody cares really. <laughs> I think I, I watched that YouTube video, and if you're just honest and earnest, and it could look like pretty bad editing, to be honest, I think they'll enjoy that regardless. But, you know, I, I spend hours then editing and trying to make it perfect with, like, slick stuff sliding in and everywhere. And, you know, it just takes a lot of time. I hear you, man. But, yeah, I'll, I'm, you know, in terms of just regular feedback, especially during times like this, I think that's super important just to, to calm people's nerves and to understand that you're still there. You're not and you're investing your money alongside with them. And during times like this, I like to increase that communication. <laughs> Okay, 
time for a little look at your portfolio now. Let's have a little broad brush description of what's going on there. Stocks, 89%. ETFs, 9%. Crypto, 3%. Those are obviously approximations. That accounts for 100% of what you have invested, and you have a cash position of around 8%. Is that the last time I looked? Is that correct? Yeah, that sounds about right. So let's talk about portfolio management. 55 positions, no single asset above 5% in your invested column. So lots of small position sizes. That's your approach. Yeah, I think it is. it seems like a lot. But like you said, I think quite a few of those are ETF positions. So for me, it's not like I don't see this as like a, you know, as individual stock position that you have to keep tabs on. I think it's the easy way to get a bit of broad market exposure. But in terms of the stocks, it's also, you know, top 20 stocks, I think, account for the majority, vast majority as a percentage, uh, both in allocation and exposure. So those are the ones I really follow and really have a lot of trust and faith in. And then the other ones are, you know, the smaller ones, which have been the ones that have been hurting a lot lately, is the ones that are less profitable companies with a lot more potential in the future. The approach for me is, you know, again, if you look at the data and you look at the statistics, it's something like, I might be butchering this again, but it's something like, you know, 80% of the return of a stock portfolio will be driven by less, fewer than 15% of the stocks in that portfolio, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So you'll have, you know, in my portfolio, certainly the stats have borne that out as well. So when I started, I invested, I think, like eight positions, and the top three was Shopify, NVIDIA, and I think Tesla. Uh, and those have just grown massively over time. So that definitely shows you that in those eight or whatever stocks that I started with, the vast majority came from those three stocks alone. So that's just looking at the data, looking at the stats, trying to get the odds in your favor. Some of those companies are definitely not going to bring the returns that you want. Some of them are going to fail. But the ones that do succeed should be the ones that drive the majority of your success. And you want to give yourself the best chance of capturing as many of those winners in your portfolio as you can. Yeah, and some of those winners that you mentioned, they're still among your largest positions. Do you still have confidence in, in all of these tech businesses that you own, that they're going to do well in the years ahead over the longer term? Absolutely. I think the top ones in the portfolio, if not more so now, given where the prices have dropped. So, you know, if you look at, I'll use an example like Shopify. So if you look at Shopify where it is now, I think it's down like 40% or something from its previous um, all-time high. If you look at the history of Shopify over the last five years, it's done that a couple of times it's dropped by more than 30 percent i think three or four times it's dropped by 40 percent i think once or twice it's now being the second time the odds for me of a company like a shopify if you look at the fundamentals and where the company is and the market share and the growth ahead of it the odds of that company just getting back to previous all-time high is i want to say there's nothing guaranteed in investing but i would say this is close as anything you're going to get into guaranteed in investing getting back to where the sharp share price was and then growing again from there. At the level where we are, even before the drop, if you look at where Shopify is, I see a lot of people using you know, like stock screeners and things to give them like give them stock ideas. So you, you typically get the guys that give you, they look at absolute growth, you know, revenue year over year growth, but they're not very profitable. So those are the those are the, the more risky bets. And then you get the companies that are very profitable, the more, you know, safer ones. Shopify is both. So Shopify is a very good example for me where it's just been thrown out with the rest of the market. It's seen as a high-flying tech stock and it's been thrown out with, you know, the, the ones that are less, a little bit more risky and less, not, are not profitable yet. Shopify is hugely profitable. It's grown its revenue by, you know, more than 30% year over year for the last three years. Just the opportunity in front of it in terms of e-commerce and the market share, how it's growing, the demand of its product. Yeah, so for me, those top investors, top three, I think like NVIDIA, Shopify, Tesla, Trade Desk, Roku, a couple of the other ones, I think the the opportunity in front of them was still just as big, if not bigger than it was when I started investing in them. 
Okay, so let's talk about recent history and what you've been doing. You touched on it a little bit earlier, what you've been doing in recent periods of market turmoil. I see you did some shorting of the market, buying as QQQ, holding for a few days in January. That's a, an ETF which tracks three times the daily performance of the NASDAQ 100. Is that a common move for you or was that kind of out of character? Uh, definitely not common. Uh, just to clarify, so that's the inverse. It tracks the inverse yeah. of the NASDAQ three times. Mm -hmm. So obviously it moves in the opposite direction. No, so to be quite honest, definitely not. I don't believe in shorting the market. I think that's the wrong side of the bet, if you, especially if you're a long-term investor. But, you know, if you've been doing this for quite some time, you kind of get those moments where the market kind of goes through an inflection point and you just know the whole sentiment where it's going. Uh, I did this in 2020 as well, where, you know, every Monday morning you'd wake up and the news was just terrible. You know, the global economy is shutting down and the cases were just rising and it was just doom and gloom. And there's no way the market sentiment is coming back from that early on. So then I also use the volatility index because you could just see the volatility spiking every Monday morning. So <laughs> it's almost like you could just see it where the market sentiment is. This time it's like the focus on technology stocks just because of where those valuations have gone to after 2020, the pull forward we've seen uh, for some of the success of those companies, you know, like Microsoft, Shopify, they expanded revenue hugely because of that pull forward out of 2020. But obviously there was going to be a bit of a reckoning but I think what you see now is a complete overreaction again. And you just see that's where the sentiment is now. And you watch, you know, you watch CNBC and you watch the headlines and it's just, you know, tech is bad and growth stocks is bad. Mm -hmm. And you need to go back into value. And in a month from now, you know, Jim Cramer will on CNBC will say something else again, like they do every three months. I, I like watching a show, by the way, but it's just the natural way of how the financial media works. It's during times like this, now you've got the Fed tightening and raising interest rates. Everybody's freaking out and it's just headline after headline. So you can just see when the market sentiment is where it's going. And during those times, it's still a bit of a gamble, I'm not going to lie. So I take a small amount and I use that to just bet against the, you know, in this case, I use the SQQQ, like you said, just to bet to kind of capture some of that sentiment on the other, towards the other end. It worked out um, for me. So, you know, I took some of the cash that I always like to keep in the portfolio. Um, and then, so doing that increased the cash position that I now had by closing that in profit. And uh, it might not have worked out, but it was a pretty good gamble to use it. But obviously, throughout that period, it was still 90% long versus short. Yeah. What else did you do then? Because I see when I look at your history, you were pretty active on the 7th of January. You closed a whole bunch of positions. So I think that might have been just some of those positions. Again, if you look at the market sentiment, um, just closing some of those uh, stocks in the portfolio that are a little bit more exposed to what the sentiment is, those companies that are largely unprofitable still at the moment. Fastly, lemonade. Fastly, exactly. So, so they were just absolutely getting hammered. I had this question as well from one of the copiers, like as a long-term investor, like why do you close that? Uh, and it's just like I said, it's that short-term, just responding to, responding to some of that short-term sentiment. I still love those companies. I still think, you know, the long-term return on those companies are still looking pretty good, especially where we are now. But I think the sentiment might continue for a couple of months, maybe still as the Fed increases those hikes and, you know, people still look at where they put their money I think the market's definitely changed and, and it might stay that way for the next year or so where people, investors in general, are going to be much more selective of where they put their money. That is by definition of what happens when you've got a rate increase cycle. So money becomes less easily obtainable. So companies that are less profitable might struggle because of the future value of money. The, the profits in the future are worth less today. And the market is just, it's a forward discounting mechanism. So it knows that. So it knows that to counter that, they need to sell off those companies today already. And I think that's a part of, large part of what you see happening now is investors pulling their money away from those companies and putting into more safer bets like the, you know, the 3M stocks and the, 
Exxon Mobil stocks and things like that. So when they, the big guys move their money out of those companies like a Fastly Lemonade, obviously that has a huge impact on the share price in the short term. So, you know, I think that's what you saw the end of January for me, just responding to a little bit of that uh, market movement. You were responsive to some extent without trying to chase the market too much. I see on eToro quite a lot of long-term investors doing nothing and getting lots of abuse for doing nothing. Mm. You see some others chasing the market a little bit too hard and you worry what's going to come of that. You're sort of somewhere in between. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I think somewhere in between and maybe somewhere towards the doing less category, I would say. You know, I'm a big proponent of sometimes doing nothing is really the best thing to do. It might look boring and it might seem to some people like you're not responding and you're not doing it. You know, I've also had a lot of questions like, you know, if you know the market sentiment is where it is, why aren't you selling more? Why aren't you shorting the market more? And I, I think that's where it gets dangerous. So, you know, we've seen it in the past. Things can change so quickly. That sentiment in the market can change so quickly. And once it does, it can, you know, if you're shorting the market, it can backfire and you uh, backfire very quickly. Um, so for me, it's like always like taking a little bit of that, weighing your options, the downside versus the upside. So for me, the upside is still definitely there in the majority of the portfolio and that will never change. It'll always be tech orientated, growth orientated, long term. Do I know I'm going to take some hits in the short term? Absolutely. That's part of it. Okay. Let's talk about one of those hits. PayPal. Yeah. Your oldest current position was bought in July 2018, quite some time ago, and that's well up. Your latest position was November 2021, which is well down. Now, a bear might say the price dropped like a stone after Q4 financials, and for good reason. They've lost all the eBay revenue. They once had something of a monopoly in their space, but that's all gone now. Cross-border transaction growth has been weakening, whilst visas is multiplying, which suggests that all the new arrivals in the space are gaining traction and taking market share. And to look at the names of who those new arrivals are, include Apple Pay, Amazon Pay, Google Pay, Afterpay, recently bought by Square, and Shop Pay. Yeah. When those names are coming for you, is it not brown trousers time? <laughs> and there are other threats, like PayPal's story is one of deceleration. Yeah. Its moat is being tested and proving increasingly easy to breach by some of the biggest guns in town. Okay, I've got a little bit more to say on this, and then you can jump in. Sure. With the revelation that they allowed 4.5 million accounts to be created by bot farms who were taking advantage of their sign-up rewards, Questions are also being asked of management oversight. And their announcements of seeking new revenue streams by becoming a super app and include crypto trading and maybe buying Pinterest and all this seem like the management know that they need to look beyond their diminishing core business if deceleration is not to become contraction. So if the moat and the management are in question, is it not clear that the tide has turned on PayPal and their best days are behind them? Would such a bear give you pause? Yeah, I think those are all valid concerns, to be honest. You know, always try and uh, read both sides when you read the, the analyst thing, like with the, the buys and the holds and what the analysts say, what the reasoning is, just to get like a, you know, to formulate your own opinion of where you're, based on your own research and blend that all together and see see where you, where you get out. I would say in response to that, absolutely, the competition has increased. Um, I think from a brand awareness and a brand strength and a company just purely, if you compare it to some of the, where those other companies are, especially in the environment where we are, those are the companies that might struggle with the interest rate cycle where we are in terms of being unprofitable, relying on future revenues in terms of where their share prices are. Um, I think PayPal has got the actual revenue and profits from, from different sources of income in their business. Venmo one of the, has been one of the big accelerators for them recently in terms of um, onboarding new users. I think what, what scared investors a lot, and you touched on it uh, during their latest um, earnings release, 
was that issue about you know how many accounts were fake versus real real money accounts and by their own definition i think and you talked about the management oversight as well i think that's maybe somewhere where they misstepped you know they in the index, index release they mentioned that they removed those numbers in that result so they by their own metrics how they calculate what is an actual account or what's something that might just be uh, I don't think they went into detail about the bot accounts. They went more into detail like promotions. They ran a lot of promotions to try and, try and um, get more accounts. And obviously, a lot of those accounts might not actually be used long term. They're just purely for people getting that promotion and not using them. What I like about it is the fact that they were honest about it or seemingly honest about it. In fact, say they knew that coming into this report, they were going to take a hit on that. They were under... Uh, underestimates in terms of the, the the numbers, and I think in this environment, people are not looking so much as re- at revenue or profit necessarily. They're looking at a, a company like PayPal as a growth story, and where are the the new numbers coming from in terms of new subscribers? So I think PayPal management knew they were going to take a hit for it, but what I like about it, they didn't shy away from it. Um, so they were quite honest. They say, "Listen, this is the way we're measuring actual real accounts," and. Uh, they also gave forward guidance, which was lower that was than previously expected because they, that's the metric they're going to use going forward. So I always like to see see that from a from an earnings call. You know, own up to your mistakes, and you know we will build again from here. So yeah, I don't, I, you know, I take all that, all of that into account. I think PayPal, like I mentioned, uh, I think the brand is just it's a very strong company. We talked about the moat, but I also look at this optionality. Just purely, if you look at the, the balance sheet for PayPal, they've got they've got the balance sheet to really go into other options in how to monetize Venmo. Venmo is, I think, until recently, still been a loss making business, even though it's been the biggest part of the revenue growth. I think it accounts for like forty percent of their overall revenue, which wasn't there at all a couple of years ago. And the eBay story, obviously, that still hurts them. But I think, again, I'm a little bit surprised about that because that's been something that's been, you know, they've talked about that for, for quite some time now that, you know, they're easing out of that, you know, uh, eBay relationship. So I'm surprised if that's still having such a big impact for, for investors and their reaction. Um, they did mention again on the earnings call again now, and they said that I think by uh, Q2, Q3 of this year, the eBay situation will completely be off the books and it won't be something they even need to mention again anymore in the earnings call. So a couple of years ago when that was announced, I think PayPal also lost a lot in terms of share price. But uh, yeah, I, I still I still like the company. I still think it's a lot of potential for it um, in that space, in that fintech space. Okay. Well, that was a good long answer. <laughs> It's always nice to get a good long answer to a question like that. It shows that you know what you're invested in. Personally, uh, our company had to use PayPal over the years. And basically because there was no other show in town, and the amount of money we've given to them in fees and yeah. Forex, I'd be delighted to see them, you know, to see their moat breached by others. Maybe it's also a bit of a bias thing for me because it's also something, it's one of the first online kind of payment things I started using a couple of years ago. Uh, maybe also just as a lack of options in South Africa. But, you know, the user experience you got out of it was so easy. And it was one of those things, you know, delighted you as a user of it after struggling for so long to get a get a mechanism, find a company. And then PayPal came along and it changed a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, an individual customer, I can see that, but a business owner having to use PayPal, especially when you're taking money in, extracting your commission and then forwarding the cash and you're paying the fees on everything, then suddenly 2% looks like a lot. It is a lot. Plus all the foreign exchange costs, but that's my own biases talking there.
Okay, let me give you a chance to tell us about your best ever investment, Reinhardt. I think, you know, if you just look at on a trade basis, I was looking at this before. I, I knew you were going to ask me this based on your previous uh, <laughs> interviews. So I was looking at my uh, system. So I, I love the data. So I keep everything, I export everything from eToro. So every single trade I record and I use uh, Microsoft's analytics tools to, to just build my own dashboard out of it. So my biggest profitable trade was Tesla that I bought in 2016, I think on the 7th of July. That was over 2,000% when I closed it. Obviously, it would have been much better if I still kept that open until today. But I think that never really tells a true story because, I mean, at that stage, you know, it was one of those taking a more of a chance at that stage in a company that was more volatile back then than it is now. Very unprofitable, very unsure at that stage where it was going to be profitable by a lot of analysts, where today, obviously, it is. It is. Um, but yeah, purely as an individual trade, that was the definitely the, the highest profit percentage. But I think as a overall position in my portfolio, the company that I've had the most faith in throughout and just had the most fun investing in and reading up was is, is Nvidia. It's been like a cornerstone of my portfolio for throughout. So that's definitely been my best investment, I think, so far. And you can't get away with telling us just about your successes. We want to hear about your failures as well. What's been your biggest stinker? So I was going to answer that to make it more interesting to say it's also NVIDIA, not because it's a stinker, <laughs> because uh, if, if I look back at, again in that data, the, the biggest opportunities I've missed is probably not investing. And I, I know hindsight is always twenty twenty, but uh, yeah. not investing more in NVIDIA. There was a time I looked at it, I think during 2018, that the market was also selling off quite a bit. And at the same time, NVIDIA was going through a little bit of issues. I think it was also at the same time we had the lowest price in crypto. So during that earnings report, the stock just got hammered because of oversupply of graphics cards not being sold through in their inventory because of mining graphics cards for mining Bitcoin and or mining Ethereum, I think more likely. For you. And the stock just got absolutely hammered. I think it was down like 50, 60% at the end of 2018. And I remember at that time, again, looking at where the company was, and they had all these growth drivers, AI, the data center was by far the biggest growth driver, um, selling the, you know, the AI crunching um, graphics cards, Never, not to mention the gaming division, all these driverless vehicles, the system they were building. So by, they had all these growth drivers and the, the stock sell off because of something like oversupply of graphics cards because of crypto. So I knew back then, you know, I knew that the stock was going to back, go back to its all-time high and it was going to go, you know, next couple of years, five years again, great investment. And, and I wasn't, a, you know, it was one of those things you're not 100% sure and I, I didn't invest back into it. I just kept the position as it was. And, yeah, so I think that's probably one of my worst investment decisions also not to invest, if, you know, doing all the research and you know what you know and then just not pulling the trigger and, and not doing it. Yeah, that's frustrating. Okay, let's talk about copiers then. Just briefly, who should copy you and who shouldn't copy you? Uh, I think if you're only investing for a year, and I, and I would almost not call it investing, if, you, if you're only looking at a year in the market, I would say, you know, don't copy me. The results will be random. The results might be bad. So that's, that's for people that shouldn't copy. And I think people that should copy are people looking for long-term growth in the markets that are, can handle that volatility in short term and that understand and have a look at the portfolio, what I'm investing in and you know, just what I'm putting on the feed and everything. If you believe like I do and some of these companies and where they'll be in the next five years, you know, those are the people that should, should be copying me. And for those people who do copy you, can you explain a little bit what role you should play as a PI in their copier portfolio? And what would that copier portfolio look like? How many PIs? What kind of PIs? Yeah, so I think we touched on this also a little bit earlier. I think as a copy trader, you have to do the same due diligence as any investor would. Um, just because you copy trading doesn't mean it's like this magic system that's going to prevent you from getting losses. 
Uh, I think you need to understand what that person is investing in and following what his interests are. So, you know, like I said, if you're copying me, you're going to get a very overweight tech growth exposure in the market. So you have to understand the volatility and the risk that comes with that. So, you know, it will depend. So if your time frame is five years or less, you know, your exposure to me should be just a part of that overall portfolio. And you should be looking at other maybe investors that are uncorrelated to the market or can give you a little bit more diversification in what they're investing in. How many PIs you reckon is about right? You've got to also be careful not to, to over-diversify. So, you know, I'm biased. So I'm going to say, I, I truly believe like technology stocks over a long term time frame, that's going to be the best wealth building sector or best place to put your money for your investment dollars over the next five, 10 years. So I would be overweight on that, but I wouldn't copy maybe five people and, and just allocate it accordingly. Because you got to understand that every person you copy underneath that copy is probably, you know, like minus like 50, 50 positions into different things. So if you're going to copy like too many people, you might be suffering from that over diversification issue as well. Do you have anyone who copies only you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of uh, obviously like friends and, and people in my circle that copy only me. Uh, so I think they kind of understand it. Uh, they, they're the kind of people that, you, they'll check in every year and then say to me, oh, you're doing fantastically well, and then check in again in a year and then still think I'm doing fantastically well. And they, they don't see the, the challenges in between, so that's that's great. That's perfect. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, there's a couple of people that have also, just through chatting on the feed and stuff, that I've, I think that's also maybe copying me exclusively or maybe... What I've seen a couple of people do is copying me, and then they start to, and I think that's a beautiful thing about eToro, they start investing themselves into a couple of stocks just here and there, or maybe just into a couple of ETFs here and there. So they have me and then a couple of other things that they, obviously that they find interesting, but they think is, is worth having some extra exposure to. What other PI would you say you know best on a personal level? Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a kind of, I suppose, a bit of an introvert in that way. So there's not there's not many that I've made too many contacts with. I've I've like reached out to like Wesley on LinkedIn, just created him as a you know connected to his network and my network on LinkedIn. Uh, chatted to him just briefly, um, but yeah, and a couple of the other PIs I think from South Africa has reached out to me also just to ask me a couple of questions like in terms of how it all works and a couple of things that I would recommend and how I do things. But yeah, I suppose that's probably one of the failings on my side. I'm not too social, I suppose, on, on, the, on that scene. I know some of the more high fro- profile uh, PIs, they, they keep in contact a little more frequently, I think. Are you part of any of these WhatsApp groups and things like that, or Telegram groups where all the PIs get together and chit chat? No. Have you ever been in the physical presence of another PI? No, unfortunately not. I think that's I think that's one of the bad things about being in South Africa. I think at the time when I was in that top 10, I think I probably would have gotten the nod at, to, as an invite from Itoro to come and meet up at the offices. I see some of the other PIs have done that, but obviously they're more local in the UK, UK-based. Obviously, it's much more difficult logistically for getting somebody from South Africa to get there. Sure. But yeah, I would, I would, I would have loved it. I would have liked, I'd like the opportunity to physically meet up with some other PIs. Okay, Reinhardt, final question. If you were in my shoes, what question would you like to have asked yourself that I didn't? Uh, it's a, I like this question. Um, I think... W- what I would have maybe asked is what motivates me as an investor, not just on eToro. I think we touched on that a little bit in terms of what 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 I want to see from being on eToro. But I think just the more, in more general, what what is the what is the motivation? What's the drive behind being investing in general? Well, this is your chance. 
<laughs> so I've got to answer it now as well. <laughs> I think uh, for me, it's building wealth. Uh, I think I listened to Ruby today on your one of your podcasts as well. She mentioned this as well. It's really building that financial freedom over over time. And I think for me, the key is also why are we doing this? You're trying to do this to give yourself that financial freedom or building that wealth for you and your family. Um, but it should also bring joy if you know if you can bring those two things together. Like money should also equal happiness. Otherwise, you know what are, what are you doing it for at the end of the day? And I think a lot of people maybe forget that as well. Like if if, you, if, if what you're doing is just causing you way too much headache and too much anxiety being in the market, then you know I've often have told myself this. Like sometimes you just need to step back a little bit because you have to enjoy it as well in the moment um, it can't just be that future goal um, you've got to you've got to be investor for life that's the way i look at it and it's got to be part of who you are and just it's got to bring you happiness as well well on that note what a great way to end it it's been a delight to talk to you reinhardt get to know you a bit better thank you so much for dropping by and sharing all of that with us Thanks very much, Kevin. This was really awesome. Great way to like doing this format. It's really awesome. Thanks for inviting me. Reinhard Kutzia there, a long-term tech investor with a loyal following who's undergoing something of a dip in performance with the market doing what it is doing now at the start of 2022. I wouldn't be surprised to see Reinhardt still going strong on eToro in another five years. That's all from me. See you on Discord and Facebook. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. Obviously anything here in this podcast for entertainment only not financial advice do your own research. This is just in our chit chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc, etc, and so forth.